ask you to grab a pew Bible and open up to John 10 for today's gospel reading, found on page 1,210. <clears throat> 1,210. John 10, the first 10 verses. And let me make it official here. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 10th chapter, beginning at the first verse. Glory to you, o Lord. <clears throat> I tell you the truth. The man who does not enter the sheep's pen by the gate, but climbs in some other way, is a thief and a robber. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of his sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he was brought out, when he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you may be seated. It's somewhat ironic that this is called Good Shepherd Sunday. And we use Psalm 23 as part of the text for the Good Shepherd, but in the text that we just read, uh, Jesus isn't really referred to as the Good Shepherd, is he? He's called the gate. And if we were to go one more verse, verse 11 reads, I am the Good Shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So we have the good shepherd who is also the gate. The gate who allows people to go in and out. Isn't that interesting? People are allowed to go in and out of the gate. They're not always inside the protective fence with the shepherd. Two weeks ago I began vacation and I left on a Monday morning to go to Amish country, came back on Tuesday afternoon and it rained the entire time. It may have stopped during the middle of the night, I don't know. But it didn't stop while I was driving, it didn't stop while I was going from the car to restaurants back to the car, back to shops. And so I didn't have a whole lot of time walking the sidewalks to check out the stores over in uh, Berlin and Walnut Creek, Mount Hope. Uh, beautiful area over there. As a matter of fact, it reminds me a lot of Wisconsin, of the area that I come from, that, is, uh, that includes rolling hills, uh, as we saw over there. But Someone asked me what my favorite part of that trip was. And I didn't realize that it was going to become part of a sermon so quickly. But everybody's heard of the Dare Dutchman, right? The Amish restaurant over there, which was just down the block from the hotel that I was staying at. And I decided that I had to go there and eat. It was, 
it was a requirement, really, to have to go there. And so <clears throat> uh, I go down there and, after visiting a couple of towns on Monday evening, and as I come out, uh, it's still raining, but out in front of the, of the restaurant is an overhang with some chairs, and so I stood out there for a little bit, and soon I noticed this uh, Amish woman coming in the direction of the restaurant. She was probably in her early 60s. Um, and I didn't know whether or not she would engage me in conversation, but I thought, you know what, I'm going to take a chance because I'm really not in a desire for conversation, but all I want to know is what time most of the Amish stores close. <laughs> so I stopped her as she came across, and I asked her what time most Amish stores closed, and it was around 5 o'clock. Uh, Yes, you're right, <laughs> Kurt. <laughs> and that simple question quickly turned into a 45-minute conversation about life, faith, and exclusion. A powerful conversation that helped me to discern my understanding of faith, to help me discern ministry, to help me discern my treatment of others. She sat there and talked about the fact that she had grown up Mennonite in Pennsylvania. She had been married to a Mennonite man and lived there for a long period of time. Had a good life with him and he passed away about 14 years ago. And then after his death, she met an Amish man um, and eventually married him and moved to Walnut Creek 12 years earlier from now, 12 years ago. And she talked about how she is now an outsider wherever she goes. She has been shunned by the Mennonites for having changed traditions. She is shunned by the Amish for being a former Mennonite. And in the middle of this community where she lives, she is completely alone. And she's distressed. She doesn't like the fact that the tradition subdues women. She doesn't like the fact that her tradition keeps out others. She doesn't like the fact that when she's challenging people about biblical scripture on love and mercy and grace, that people don't have an answer to it and therefore default to tradition. Where am I supposed to go? Where can I be accepted? And I sat there and I listened to her, and, and that's what she needed, was someone to be able to voice out her concerns. She wanted to go back to Pennsylvania, but her husband wasn't going to make the move. Do I leave and go anyway? Because I'm not accepted here. She had taken some theology classes, and the teachers of those two or three classes had all told her, you have prophetic gifts. You are able to see truth beyond the community. You're able to see bigger picture. There's a calling for you. That's a special gift. And she has no place to use it. She's not heard. And she looked at me and she said, you said you were a pastor. I've spoken in tongues. 
that's not accepted in our tradition. What church are you in? Does, that, does your church accept that? <laughs> I'm Lutheran. Oh. <laughs> There's no speaking in tongues. But Pentecostal is a tradition that speaks in tongues. Some Baptist speak in tongues. There may be some opportunities. I just want to go where I'm accepted. And then she gave me a history lesson that I may have learned in seminary and I don't remember. Lutheranism and her traditions are hand in hand. They actually made the split at the same time from Catholicism and the difference that split us from them was infant baptism. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. We are bombarded by so many voices, aren't we? Within our own heads, from family members, from our community, even from the pastor. They will know my voice. They know, not they will, they know my voice. How many voices are getting in our way? How many voices are keeping us from hearing Jesus' voice, Jesus calling to us? In honor of Mother's Day, I go back to my grandmother, a retired United Methodist pastor. And I remember a conversation that I had with her before she passed away in which she said, you know, uh, Randy, um, in ministry so many people come to the pastor for advice, for suggestions, and most of the time, they already know the answer. Most of the time, they already know the answer, and they're looking for an option that isn't going to be as painful and as challenging as the truth. And so in my conversations, it's not about my advice. It's about helping them to understand the truth that is already within them. That voice of Christ. Like Lydia, we often struggle with what voice we are to listen to. And listening to Jesus' voice doesn't guarantee that things are going to be any easier. They don't promise that the journey is going to be convenient. They don't promise that we're going to be wealthy, that we're going to be smart, that we're going to be old enough, that we're going to be young enough, that we're going to be thin enough, that we're going to be enough. But what that voice says is, I love you. Put your name in there. It's not a general, I love you. I love you, Randy, Rick, Julie, Erica. And through my blood and through my body, you are forgiven.
Our decisions aren't easy. Our actions aren't easy. We're never promised that it's going to be easy. But we are promised that Christ is with us till the end of the age. And we can live life abundantly in Christ. Abundantly doesn't promise ease either. It does promise peace and joy as we continue the journey knowing he is with us. Amen. Please stand for the hymn of the day, The King of Love My Shepherd Is.